Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Business Spotlight. I'm Scott McMeans, and I am sitting today with Sam Corey from the Lakeland Equity Group. And what we're like to talk about is what's made him successful, what he's seen throughout his career that has brought not only his own career, but the career of others to a different level. So if I could, Sam, I'm going to turn the microphone and the camera over to you and tell us a little bit about yourself and your business. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. And thanks for, you know, inviting me to talk with you, Scott. Um, you know, Sam Corey, Lakeland Equity Group. And, you know, the first thing that I am is uh, is a girl dad. I'm a father to three girls. And, um, you know, as, as a wrestler, as a former wrestler, that that was not what I expected. And that's been one of my greatest lessons in life. Um, you know, and I'm a husband to a wonderful wife who's very supportive and you know, as, as we're here to talk about success, I would say that getting your partner right is probably one of the most critical components to that. Um, but my business career, you know, I would say jokingly, it started at four years old, peeling potatoes with my dad and in, in the restaurants. My dad was in the restaurant business, my mother and father. And, you know, my dad would always bring me with him, um, you know, every day, almost every day to work. And we used to work weekends growing up. So work has always been a very critical component of our family culture. Um, when I graduated college, uh, I wanted to follow in those footsteps. So I started in the restaurant business. And um, within a couple of years, I realized that that was just not where I wanted to see my life forever. So I started working and focusing primarily in real estate, doing value add redevelopment, buying things where I could and could not. Uh, just kind of fast forwarding a little bit, that led to more of a structured work with some brand names such as Tim Hortons, uh, Dunkin' Donuts, uh, some names that are recognizable where we did their program work. And then that led to some opportunities in, in what's called the capital markets, which is basically where you're doing larger deals, more financially structured deals. Um, and then that kind of led to Lakeland Equity Group. So, you know, my, my, um, giving you kind of a cliff notes version, my career has been um, so far, you know, a lot, a series of a lot of just evolution and a lot of starting fresh. You know, I, I joke around with my wife and I say that, um, you know, every 10 years we're starting a new company or every seven years we're starting. I thank her. I say, hey, thanks for starting this company with me five years ago, then this company, then this company, then this company. So, <laughs> you know, I, I was born in a culture where we were, you know, built to be entrepreneurs. I'll tell you that, you know, 12 year overnight successes, you didn't realize the 12 years, you just kind of saw the overnight success. And I didn't realize how difficult it would be. And it's gotten a lot tougher with the way that the economy is and the CYA culture that's gone around in every single facet of the world, whether it's your home mortgage to your investor loans, you know, people are getting more educated. Um, so, you know, entrepreneurship is tough, but I wouldn't have it any other way because freedom is a very critical component to my value system. So that that's a Cliff Notes version. I mean, I could go into way more detail, but, um, you know, I like and, it. And I've been involved in a lot of businesses and things like that, too. But real estate is really my core focus and what I love doing the most. Well, I love the idea that you said freedom is a critical component to your vision. I'm curious how that ties back to being a girl dad. I would imagine yeah. <laughs> they, 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 they require quite a bit. Yeah. I mean, look, when my first daughter was born, you know, everybody, I hear a lot of people tell stories like, oh, my, you know, my kid came out and oh, my, my life changed. Well, I, I'm, I'm here to tell you that didn't happen for me. I mean, I always felt like I was on the straight and narrow, but it took about nine months. And then I started to realize the power of having a kid. And um, right around the nine month mark, she started interacting back. And that's when focus set in for me. And she, what, what a kid, what my daughter did for me, my first daughter was first up, she opened me up to the possibilities of the world as a female, you know, as a man, it's kind of like a good plan is invisible. I never had to really think about that. I was just worried about myself in a sense. Now I have this daughter. So now I have to consider, okay, what's the world going to be like for her? So that was one of the first most important things she did for me. But the second thing is I call her, I call the kids, the greatest filter, the greatest BS filter, right? Because, <laughs> you know, when you talk about a value system, your values should be there for you to make decisions. That's what values are for. So if it doesn't go with your value, 
So what the, what my daughter did for me was, you know, hey, family members in a fight over here. I ain't got time for that. I, you know, I got to go take care of my daughter. Go get distracted by a business over here that's going to take you, you know, 30 hours a week on top of your 40 hours you're putting in now. No, no, I'm not going to do that. So she gave me focus and then I would just, and the focus was really centralized on real estate. Because as I mentioned, I was involved in other opportunities from hospitality to uh, fitness and different things. But when she was born, I just kind of said, you know, I just have to focus here. So that's what, that's what having a daughter did for me. Having three, what that did for me is it makes me, um, it makes me put in more hours a week because they're already buying a lot of things. So <laughs> that's, that's about it. Again, no, I love my I, yeah. no, Sam, you, you bring it home with the idea of focus, focus on what needs to be done so you can leave them a better world. Focus on making sure your values are upheld as a as a husband as a father, and then somebody responsible for a business you need to focus to make sure it keeps going. And because you have three daughters relying on you, your focus is heightened to a degree that all right. Whenever it comes time to make decisions, I I believe you're making them with a value system in in mind, and the outcomes at the forefront of what you're trying to get done. That's that's a, that's an astonishing thing to do, and it's interesting. Um, I talk to so many different people. And there's always different ways of saying the same thing and that most people get into being a business owner because they want freedom. They don't realize all the money it takes. They don't realize all the sacrifice it takes until they're doing it. And they always say, I wish I would have went back and spent more time doing the right thing. Um, sounds like you're doing the right thing, which is which is a testament to you as, as an individual, not only as a, a husband and a father, but as a business person. So kudos I'll, to you I'll, with that. I'll tell you, you're touching on something that I I really I think about this a lot, which is if you, if I knew how hard it was going to be, would I have done it, or would I have wanted to know how hard it was and still decide to do it? And that's something mm. that I you know like what with what we're doing at Lakeland Equity. I got to be, you know, frank with you. We're sitting there and we're thinking, oh, this can't be too tough. And then you start doing it and it's tough, but it's rewarding. And we love doing it. We love the position we're in. But at the same time, now I'm thinking in hindsight 2020, right? But I'm thinking, I wish I would have known how hard it was and decided to do it anyways. So I, I have a kind of an internal battle with that. You know, it's almost yeah. like a nurture argument, right? Because I don't know which is better. You know, and actually, I just saw a speech, the NVIDIA CEO, whose name escapes me, but he literally just said the same thing. He said, if we knew how hard it was going to be, we would never do it. But look at him now. Right. And mm -hmm. so that's the thing you have to you have to know that at the end of it all, you're going to you're going to keep going until you get it. And in my mind, you know, a mentor of mine asked me one time, he said, why don't you just take it? If, if this company offered you half a million and, and to run this, blah, 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 would you do it? I said, maybe for a year. He goes, seriously, maybe for a year? I said, maybe for a year. And I have a goal. I said, I won't stop until I hit this goal, you know, this monetary goal. Mm -hmm. And he said, that's awesome. You know, so like for me, I can't stop until I hit that goal. And who's to say I'll stop when I hit it. But that's that's something that definitely drives me a lot because I've had the goal since I was 22 years old. And it's like, until I hit that goal, I won't stop. Now, if working for that company for a year gets me closer to that goal. I'll make an educated decision to do that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think, I think one of the things that we might talk about is like just, you know, regrets or, or things like that, or some advice for the community. And, and I'm going to give you one right now, disregard your twenties. That was, <laughs> no, I'm I hope some young people hear this. I mean, disregard your twenties. Do not take yourself seriously in your twenties. You need to be an accumulator in your 20s. And what I mean by that is a relationship accumulator, not a job title accumulator, not a companies that you worked at accumulator. Mm -hmm. If I would have as a as my 20s, and I have a rule that once you have kids, you can't have regrets because then you would never meet them. But I look back and I think, okay, if I could have done a little bit differently, I would have looked at these roles in companies, not as an employee. But as an, I'm accumulating relationships for my yeah. next event, because if you're an entrepreneur, that's only going to benefit you, right? Look at all these guys, 50 years old, starting new funds in New York City. Where did they work for 30 years? They worked at Goldman. Now, they they probably were a little late to hatch. <laughs> I mean, they should have probably hatched at 35 years old into the entrepreneurial world. 
but what you know whenever you do it you do it right because they had already accumulated all the titles and relationships and what is that culture reward titles and relationships in on wall street so i just wish and you know if i had one thing i could give myself advice on it would be to have no ego in your 20s be extremely humble vulnerable and just accumulate as many relationships as you can because that's it people are a power law people are a power law and you know you got to spend time with people and you got to get to know people and using a company is the greatest platform to do that right now in this economy right when you're younger i mean when you're I, when you're there as well i mean don't get me wrong I, I agree with you my um my daughter just graduated college she's going into her first career position and she's asking tons of questions and i said you work there until you've learned enough to get promoted or you've learned enough to realize you're not there fit and yeah. you move on that that's yeah. it but 100%. do it in such a way that you accumulate as much knowledge and network or relationships as you can and that that's a great piece of advice for people starting out is don't take yourself so seriously but be serious about what you're trying to build exactly just have the end yep. in mind you know yes i, I agree with that so i'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the now that you're in the ceo role what are the things that you're learning that are justifiable to your career aspirations or something that is not necessarily what you thought it was going to be, but you've been able to deal with. So what's it like being a CEO and what have you learned since you've been in that position? You know, I, I think it goes back to a little bit of what I was just talking about with people being a power law. You know, COVID uh, did this big magic trick on people where we started to think that we could get things done through Zoom and we can get things done without people. You know, and then AI comes right up at, you know, right behind it and kind of says, okay, you don't need as many people to do things. But let me let me just be very frank. The most important thing in, in leadership is people. Now, mm -hmm. that's people that you work with. That's people that you look for. You know, we are always sourcing capital. So who's on the other side of that? People. It's not AI making a capital decision. We're always sourcing deal flow. Who's on the other side of that? It's people. So I would say that, you know, one of the biggest, you know, you you kind of framed it as a positive and, and a negative. And I'm going to put people on both because you need to, you, you people can be, if you're not great at working with people, it can really, and if you're not focused on them, right. And, and from an, from an enthusiastic and um, encouraging way, you're not going to be able to go far on all three, you know, pipeline, investors, all that leadership and same on the other side. So, and and I will say that for me, <clears throat> I've been back to when my daughter was born. The focus was about building a company that was very um, horizontally integrated, meaning we didn't have a lot of overhead. We had one guy for engineering. We had a guy for civil. We had a guy for construction. We had these relationships where nobody was technically employed by me but they were all part of our company on, on a deal by deal basis. I built that because my nature is a little bit of a lone wolf. You know, I, I kind of, I don't love as much to work with people. Not that I don't love to work with people, but I'm pref, pref, I prefer to just kind of, you know, put my head down and power through and not have to rely. And so okay. when my daughter, when I, you know, I leaned into that so I could have freedom to spend more time with her. And then, you know, the following kids, but the biggest realization stepping into this role which is definitely more, you know, it's more national. It's more, um, it's more, uh, more compliant driven. You know, we're definitely at a higher level than we were as developers, just from an underwriting strategy, due diligence, everything's just a level above, you know, I'd say a, a degree below wall street, almost in a way, what we do now, um, people are at the core of it all. And I, I would be very, very much willing to bet a lot of money that, any business, it's the same. Even if you're local, regional, national, medical, retail, you know, it's all people and you see it every day. So people's my answer. <laughs> no, it's a great answer. And I think, you know, some of the people I get a chance to work with, I wouldn't say it's their number one challenge, but it is always in the top two or three is people, right? It's typically how much time they work, how much money they're making or not making, and then the people on their team. It's always those three things that, that rise to the top. And what I've discovered is 
the quote unquote soft skills that we had dictated to us decades ago are actually some of the most important and valuable skill sets anybody can have, whether you're a leader or not, is the ability to communicate with and comprehend back and forth a dialogue that is productive. And what we have today is a lot of interest in a very myopic, self-centered perspective, and we're not outward thinking or empathetic towards a situation that could be benefited from what yeah. our contribution could be interacting with people. And this is a really good uh, testimony, Sam, about how not necessarily we need to change things, but recognize what's in front of us and see yeah, it right, as an right. opportunity to be better, right? Recognize because, a good point. because social media is not interaction, right? Social media no. is not social. And I think a lot of people are kind of in the mental checklist, right? Oh, I commented on my friend. That's social. I did my social for the day. Yeah. You know, that that's totally different from going to a conference shaking hands with people. I just came back from a conference in New York. My good friend, Rich, he pushed me to go. And he, I mean, I cannot believe, you know, it's kind of like that imposter syndrome, right? I cannot believe the type of phone calls we're having now with these groups. I mean, we're, we're Perry pursue with them, right? I mean, we're good, just as good as they mm -hmm. are, but you know, it's just incredible what being in person does to a relationship. Yes. The call gets in. So say I, I can take, these 10, you know, I still have the business cards here, right? I can take these 10 companies, categorize them, do an outreach, and I'll get a 10% response rate. But having met them, I have a 100% response rate on my emails. That, uh, that's the difference. Yeah. I mean, but we're only well, one person. We can't do everything. Mm -hmm. and so you got to be smart about it. So would it be safe to say, Sam, that you believe COVID took us on a tangential path away from people skills? And now we're coming back to a more recognizable need for people skills. Yeah, definitely. I think COVID was, I think COVID for a lot of people was a very convenient thing when it came to like work, right? I mean, imagine if you're the you're a father or mother, three kids at home, and your job requires you to travel three, four times a month. I mean, what an awesome situation to not have to travel. And to do Zoom meetings, right? Yep. But once the fairy tale and you know the honeymoon is worn off, which it has for a year now, people want to see people again. Something is, you know, it's it's kind of just undescribable, right? But people want to see people again. Conferences are full again. That person that you were doing Zoom meetings with all the time, they're kind of getting sick of it. They don't want to do it anymore. They want you to come do a visit, though they might not be saying it. So, you know, I think I think COVID's done. I think anybody who's hanging on to it is just being lazy, really. I think that period of our life is kind of over. Now, the masks and things like that, being cautious, I've noticed it in our own life. We used to drop my kids off at my at my mom's house, no questions asked. Now we hear somebody's got a little bit of a sickness and, you know, we're holding her back. That's a COVID, but maybe a good thing that came from COVID. But the business side of it, I think anybody who's hanging on to that culture is just, I, I think it's just being lazy and because they loved the convenience of not having to travel. And I don't blame them. I mean, I'd, I'm sitting here telling you I'm a lone wolf and, you know, things like that by nature. But I also do love COVID made me realize how much I love people. I, yeah. you know, I could went COVID thinking I, I don't need people. Then COVID happened. I'm like, I need people. You know, this is crazy. So, yeah, I definitely. I definitely I, I, I agree with that. I think I think we're we're getting away from the COVID mentality and getting back to reality, which is let's press some flesh, let's get in a room, let's read body language, let's see how people interact and act with each other so we can be productive. I think it's I think it's a great move back to where we are very comfortable. I want to talk about some of the thank you. Uh, some of the challenges, you know, you're, you're mentioning people are the positive and the negative. What other challenges that you see for not only your industry, but for your business that you're looking to address in the next, let's say, three year time frame? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the challenges that we specifically run into is that um, there's a lot of we're really good at sourcing opportunities. And, you know, we kind of had this idea that everybody by now had been really well versed on Warren Buffett's famous line, which is if there's blood in the streets, it's time to invest. Right. Or, you know, any of those variations, you know, 
down buying the down cycle. Buy. But what you're finding is that a lot of capital, even institutional capital, somehow still didn't get that memo. And they're still holding back a lot of capital. They're still being very conservative, which, you know, you can't really, you can't, I'm not a 5% guy. I don't like to just make 5% of my money, but I'm also not a $1 billion family office, right? So some of these guys got very comfortable saying, why would I take risk when I'm making 5% on my money in the bank? And I guess mm -hmm. I get that. But the opportunity cost of that 5% is probably a 25% annualized return on the other side or a legacy property, you know, here in downtown Cleveland that you can buy for $20 a square foot when it was just sold for 300. So, you know, one of the challenges that we run into always is just con the conservative nature of, um, you know, of, of investors. And the second challenge we run into, one of the things that we're, one of the theses of what we started Lakeland to be was to take Wall Street type opportunities and offer them to retail investors. And so one of the challenges that we didn't anticipate was that there's a couple of reasons why these Wall Street like opportunities are just for Wall Street. But the one that is, that is probably the biggest challenge for us is, is just understanding it because it's a lot, of, it's very language heavy, right? We do okay. preferred equity. What's preferred equity? You know, a lot of retail, what's preferred equity? But see, our advantage is that if you're just investing in a project and you have no rights, what preferred equity does by investing with us is it gives you rights. You see, so trying to bridge that gap between being a basic investor and then being an investor in our position, which is an investor in the deal as well, that we have better rights than you had as a quiet investor, that's some, that's some of the challenges that we run into when we're explaining it to new LPs and new investors, because not everybody understands that lingo. So I would say the biggest challenge, and just as a general statement, is always telling the story, you know, telling the story properly and telling the story in a universal fashion, simply, and um, trying to take something that's reserved for Wall Street and make it a little bit more retail is a very challenging thing because there's definitely a lot of reasons why it's it's built for Wall Street. Um, so yeah, I mean, those are just a couple of things, but uh, the the right answer is that every day is a challenge because the struggle <laughs> is guaranteed. I mean, truly, the struggle is guaranteed. You get 20 emails that are a challenge. You get, you know, we don't, as entrepreneurs, nobody's patting you on the back. You know, you don't, you don't get, as a leader, a lot of people are not, you know, writing you emails or, you know, somebody on the other side of a business deal isn't messaging you saying, hey, that's the greatest thing ever. They reward you by coming back, you know, but that's not a pat on the back. That's not a shout out on Instagram. So, you know, the challenge is always just staying sane and just knowing that the struggle is guaranteed. So figure out the balance. We have a, we have rules in our house that I'm teaching my girls. And the number one rule is quarries don't pout. And I just cling on to that because I find pouting to be the least valuable thing that anybody can do in any situation. It has a 0% ROI. So I want my <laughs> girls to constantly have the mindset of Corey's don't pout. So they pout. I say, Corey's don't pout. They figure it out. I can't imagine when they're 28, 29 years old and they're up against a family that may not have told their kids not to pout. Like my, my girls are going to eat their lunch, you know, and yeah. that's what I want because they don't pout. There's no value in it. Right. So every day is a challenge. The struggle is guaranteed and you just got to work past it. Um, and and just keep fighting, fight the good fight. I it love it. Long, it. Takes a long time to get to make be successful. That's no, that's this, another. By the way, <laughs> nobody tells you that. that. That's another. Nobody tells you. Everybody thinks it's overnight. But you know, I was just talking to my uncle. He's got three hundred million under management. I said, "How long have you been doing this?" Two thousand twelve is when I remember. He said, "No, I started in 2000. It's like twenty four years. Yeah, like wow. But look at him now. Right. Diligence, patience, they all come into play, correct? Diligence, patience, um, right seats, uh, right people on the right seats on the bus, you know, you know your weaknesses. I mean, I it took me 20 years to realize my weaknesses. And that's why I brought in some great partners that do do what I they do it way better than I do. I'm okay and, with that. And that that's perfectly fine. There's there's a really good lesson to be learned here and that is 
you said diligence, patience, and getting the right people on the right position on the bus with you. And it's okay to admit, I don't know everything, but I know somebody who can help me. Right. Always. And you bring I those did. people into your stable and you strengthen your farm. That's just how it works. I think a lot of people can really learn the lesson of you don't have to be there alone. Now you're you're a lone wolf. You're a self-professed lone wolf, right? But you've also professed on this podcast that you do in fact have people that you like and trust with your business. And they're in that position because they're good enough to be with you and you're open enough to have them be there for you. It's a big oh, yeah. piece. It's a really big piece. I, I, um, I don't, I want to just do what I love doing. And that took me some time, maybe because the way I was raised was, you know, we, 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 we my dad was in the restaurant business. We were there all the time. Right. Yeah. That was kind of, that's what I saw. It's like, you're there all the time. But as, as I've kind of evolved and I've seen some great leaders and mentors in my life and how they operate, I've realized that I like doing two or three things and I'm actually really good at them. And so I'm just going to focus on those two or three things and continue. I'm dangerous in the other areas. That's what I always say. You know, like, <laughs> you know, my my uh, portfolio and acquisition analyst, he's way better than me at doing all these Excel and data and things like that. But I'm pretty dangerous at it, you know, and, and we know that about each other. So he's more detail oriented than I am, for example. I'm more granular business plan. So, you know, it's just I really... Wanna... This is good. Oh, you said there's two or three things you love doing and you're really good at. How would you yeah. classify those three things? Yeah, no, it's it's simple. Strategy. I love doing. Um, um, so I, I actually say this as this is what I am to the company. I'm strategy. I'm deal flow and I'm capital relationship. So I'm capital raising. So those are the three things that I like doing. Um, I love finding deals. That's like my favorite thing in the world. I love thinking about strategy. And I love meeting new people, which eventually turns into capital raising. So um, I'm I'm having a lot of fun being being more focused on. I'm just, I'm I'm trying to spend most of my days focused on genuinely building relationships and not okay. really being on the computer. Some of the most successful guys I know, some of my mentors, they spend one hour in their office. You know, so you want to be people rich. You don't have to be money rich, but you want to be people rich and you want to be. And by the way, if, if it's all, you know, if it's all just to get to your goal, people are going to sniff that out in a second. There has to be some genuineness there. Like, look, if I meet somebody and we genuinely, this happened about six months ago, we genuinely, I could tell, I didn't like him. He didn't like me. I could call him, but I'm not, I'm not even going to call him. You know, we have similar deals right. that we could do. I don't genuinely want to work with this person. So I'm not going to be inauthentic, you know? So authenticity is super important in those kinds of things. And if you just don't like people, then you got to, you should go into, you know, AI or some kind of data business, <laughs> really. Because, what, you know, what we do in finance and real estate, it's a people business. And that's been something that I, I, I like. I'm a forced extrovert because if, if my wife, she jokes around, she's like, I don't understand one of my dreams is just to go to like the Hawking Valley for two days by myself. And she's like, what do you mean? I'm like, no, no, I just like to be in my own thoughts, you know, strategy. Mm -hmm. We just talked about just thinking about strategy, just thinking about life, thinking about the family. I love being by myself, but I also have learned that I do get a lot of energy and joy out of people. And so, you know, balancing all that, but again, strategy, capital raising deal flow. That's what I love doing. I don't love doing analytics. I don't love doing data. You know, I love doing that. I love it. And a couple of things just to close this out, because we have a few minutes left. I want to ask you, you've given me a lot of stuff to go by. And what is the for, or what is the future? What do you foresee happening with Lakeland um, in the next three to five years? Yeah. So what, we're, you know, what, what we want to do, we're, we took our mindset as being a developer and a sponsor of real estate deals. And we said, we want to take that and basically support people who are probably better than us, but also are really good at being developers and sponsors to deals. So that's why we shifted our focus away from, and we still are, we're still acquiring locally, but we shifted our focus nationally more into a supportive equity role because we felt like we were in a very unique position to evaluate these deals, right? We're not a banker, we're an actual developer. So if you send us something, 
we actually have a credible opinion, right? So we want to stay in that credit focus. You know, it's called private credit, essentially. And that can come in the form of an equity investment, a debt investment, or a hybrid. So we want to stay there basically for the rest of my life. And, and honestly, my kids and my family lifestyle, they're factored into the goals of why I want to do that. I want to build that. something for them where I'm still available to them, but they might actually have an option to join something. So my vision for the company is we want to continue to grow annually. We want to adjust. We want to be market reactors because that's very critical in real estate. You know, today we're doing preferred equity. Two years, we might be doing joint venture equity, but we want to be very focused and disciplined the way we invest. I'm not sure if you're looking for dollar goals, but we want to be a, you know, a, a billion ish plus, you know, double digit billion dollar company in 20 years. I'm not I'd love to hear that. It's okay if we're not that in 10 years. It's okay if we're not that in five years. And we have this thing, goal forecast, right? My goal is that we want to be 10 billion in 10 years. My forecast is 20 years. So what that does is it allows me to grow properly. I'm not, even though we're, we have debt-like positions, I don't love debt. I've always been very adverse to it. Grow properly, grow with the right people. The only people that I'll ever own a piece of this company are people that work in it. You know, so that just that mindset of inclusion and growing and things like that. I love that. So last thing before we, we head out, you've kind of touched base on a number of different things. Uh, I love the idea in the conversation we had. If you were to go back, would you do it the same way, knowing what you know now? Or would you do it differently if you didn't know? And I, I love the, the, the conversation around that because not everybody knows exactly what would happen. And I think... If you would go back and start over knowing what you know, you would have ended up differently. If you go back and you learn the lessons that you've learned through what you experienced, you'd be right back where you are. I don't know which one's better or worse, to be honest with yeah. you. Yeah. Right. So I'm I'm going to ask you just a simple question. If you were to sit down next to the 18 year old Sam, what would you say to 18 year old Sam? Go to New York after college. So <laughs> if you remember what I said, after you have a kid, and assuming you love your kids, <laughs> like oh, 100%, you know, 100%. right. Assuming you're a great dad and you love your kids. Right. So that's who I am. Okay. And, and that's who you are. I can tell. I, as, whenever you have a kid, you can no longer have regrets. So forget about it. Forget about yeah. dream about doing the touchdown in the state title, you know, state football game. Forget about going to this college versus that college. You cannot have regrets because you would never meet your kids. I actually think and maybe I'm going to give somebody an idea here. They better cut me in. I actually think it would make an incredible movie that you go back and you try to recreate your life because you you miss your wife and your kids if you yeah. actually had that chance. So I'm going to preface my answer by saying that, that, but I allow myself one piece of advice that I would give my 18 year old self. And that is move to New York after your for a couple of years in your twenties, because I will tell you that that city doesn't make money New York doesn't make money in New York. New York makes money on the backs of America. And so yeah. I would have ended up back in Cleveland for sure. But back to my advice to the 20 year olds, I would have came back with contacts and relationships and knowledge of one of the most important cities in the world, right? So today I'm working very hard to make relationships there because they do control a lot of capital, a lot of mind power too. It's not all take. There's a lot of mind power and a lot of energy in that market, but I'm having to build them, you know, at 39 years old. Whereas if I would have just went not taking myself seriously, I don't need the penthouse. I can live in the shoebox, enjoy people. You know, that's the, probably the one piece of advice I would give myself. I know it doesn't probably benefit anybody listening to this. No, that's, but, you know, that's, that's, some, that's, that's exactly what people need to hear.